All right, we're going to call this meeting of the Maricopa County Board of Supervisors in session. I'd like to ask our uh, clerk of the board to please call the roll. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Supervisor Sellers? Here. Supervisor Chukri? Here. Supervisor Hickman? Here. Supervisor Gallardo? Here. And Chairman Gates? Here. So again, this is the time that has been set for the hearing requested by Maricopa County Assessor, Paul Peterson. Uh, the board, as we have informed council, the board has allotted four hours for this hearing. And as you can see on the digital clock, we're counting down from, from four hours. Uh, the board will be assisted today by our clerk of the board, Fran McCarroll, who will be swearing in witnesses. And will also be assisted by John Doran, who is counsel to the board. Uh, before we proceed to Mr. Peterson and his opportunity to present his case, I want to go over a few things. First of all, the specific issue that's going to be addressed today in this hearing. Secondly, a brief timeline of the events that are relevant uh, to this case. And then finally, those documents that we have already deemed to be part of the hearing record. And then uh, we will hear from Mr. Peterson. I want to start by explaining where we're at right now. So under Arizona law, the Board of Supervisors is empowered to suspend the county assessor for up to 120 days when the board determines that the county assessor has engaged in neglect of duty. On October 28th, 2019, the Board of Supervisors voted unanimously to suspend county assessor Paul Peterson for 120 days based on neglect of duty. Arizona Revised Statute Section 11-664 only authorizes the board to suspend the assessor and the treasurer, no one else. So therefore, the discussion of any other county-wide elected officials is irrelevant to today's proceeding. Um, prior to voting on the suspension, this board identified two potential grounds for the neglect of duty. First, that Mr. Peterson did not perform the duties of the office during the approximately three weeks that he was in law enforcement custody. And secondly, that Mr. Peterson had used county property to run his private adoption business. Therefore, there are just two questions before us today. First, did Mr. Peterson neglect his duties as the county assessor from October 8th, 2019 through October 29th 2019 when he was in law enforcement custody? And secondly, did Mr. Peterson neglect his duties as the county assessor by using county facilities and property to run his private law practice and adoption business? Again, the board voted unanimously to suspend Mr. Peterson, and Mr. Peterson has asked us to reconsider our decision. Therefore, to give some background uh, for this hearing, I'll briefly review the timeline of events. Again, on October 8th, 2019, law enforcement authorities took Mr. Peterson into custody, where he remained until October 29th, 2019. Mr. Peterson has been charged with a variety of crimes by the federal government, the state of Utah, and the state of Arizona, all arising out of his adoption business. To our knowledge, Mr. Peterson went into custody without any warning to the assessor's office, to his deputies or staff. And certainly while in custody, Mr. Peterson never contacted me as the chair of this board. Uh, and he also did not contact any other members of the Board of Supervisors. On October 23rd, 2019, the Board of Supervisors voted in an open meeting to conduct another open meeting on October 28th, 2019, to consider whether to suspend Mr. Peterson for neglect of duty under Arizona Revised Statute Section 11664. Also, on October 23rd, 2019, the Board notified Mr. Peterson via his attorney and also through the U.S. Marshal that the board had voted to set this meeting on October 28th, 2019 to discuss suspension. On October 24th, 2019, I sent a letter to Mr. Peterson through the U.S. Marshal asking him to answer two questions. One, 
Since you were arrested and detained on October 8th, 2019, how are you fulfilling your duties as the elected assessor? And two, please exp explain how and why over a thousand documents relating to your private legal practice are stored on your county desktop and or the county servers or physically stored in your county office. This letter that I just referred to is part of the record of this proceeding. Mr. Peterson did not respond personally or through counsel to these two questions. In fact, to date, Mr. Peterson has never provided answers to these questions asked of him uh, in the notice of possible suspension letter dated October 24th, 2019. On October 28, 2019, the County Internal Audit Department reported to the board its findings with respect to a high-level audit of the County Assessor's Office. That audit found over 500 documents on Mr. Peterson's county computer and related county systems dealing with his private law practice and adoption business. The audit also found that Mr. Peterson used his county internet access county email account and county phone for the adoption business. Also, on October 28th, 2019, the board met and unanimously voted to suspend Mr. Peterson for 120 days due to his neglect of duty. Again, the vote was based on his failure to meaningfully oversee the operations of the office for an extended period of time and his repeated misuse of county resources to conduct his private law practice, which the board found to be neglect of duty. On October 29th, 2019, the board notified Mr. Peterson of the suspension and informed him of his right to a hearing. Mr. Peterson then requested uh, the hearing on November 7th, 2019, and the board subsequently set this date today for the hearing. On October 29th, 2019, Mr. Peterson was released from custody, although he still faces criminal prosecution in three jurisdictions based upon his, adopt, his private adoption business. On November 13th, 2019, the board also invoked its authority under the suspension statute to ask the county attorney to conduct an independent investigation with respect to the suspension issues and the county attorney retained an independent third-party law firm, Mitchell, Stein, Carey, and Chapman, to conduct the investigation. In November of 2019, the board, through its outside counsel, demanded that Mr. Peterson immediately return his county-issued laptop. The board gave Mr. Peterson 48 hours to return the laptop. Mr. Peterson did not return the laptop to the county, Instead, the laptop was seized pursuant to a search warrant. On December 5th, 2019, the Mitchell Stein firm presented its preliminary investigative report. That preliminary investigative report and all exhibits are part of the record of this proceeding. I wanna be clear, this hearing is not a forum to prove or disprove that Mr. Peterson engaged in criminal conduct, nor is this the forum to prove that others have done what Mr. Peterson did, but we're not suspended for it. We're here for one reason and one reason only, and that is to allow Mr. Peterson to demonstrate that he did not do the two things that serve as the basis for this board's suspension. I think definitely we're all interested to hear from Mr. Peterson. Now, the rules of evidence do not apply to this proceeding, but I have outlined the issue to be decided today by the board and so the focus of any testimony and questioning will be redirected back to relevant issues if the testimony becomes irrelevant. Prior to the hearing, the parties have reached no stipulations. Mr. Peterson is not required to make an opening statement, but individually or through his counsel, he's certainly welcome to present an opening statement. Mr. Peterson may then uh, present witnesses who will be sworn in by our clerk of the board. And Mr. Peterson, again, individually or through counsel may ask questions of the witnesses that he has called. Then the witnesses may be asked questions by me, the other members of the board, or by our counsel, John Doran. Again, as we stated, this hearing is set for four hours, but this may be the most important thing that I say. Every hour, we will be taking a 10-minute break uh, to, to take care of things. 
So if Mr. Peterson wishes to give a closing statement at the end of this, just please reserve the time uh, to, to make those closing remarks. And also wanted everyone to know that at the end of this hearing, the board will take this matter under advisement. So at this point, uh, I would ask counsel for Mr. Peterson uh, to please uh, come join us here at the table and uh, state your name for the record. And again, please keeping in mind the narrow issue that's been presented today for this board's consideration. Thank you, Chairman Gates. Uh, my name is Corey Langhofer, and I'm at council table with uh, my law partner, uh, Tom Basile. We represent Paul Peterson. Um, a, a couple of housekeeping items first before we dive into the substance. I, I believe you said that all the exhibits to the Mitchell Stein and Kerry report are part of the record. Is that correct? That's correct. So there's no need to enter those separately. That's correct. Um, <clears throat> we have made clear outside of these walls our view of hearings like this. I won't repeat that here. I'm going to suspend disbelief for the next two hours or so in the interest of making to you serious arguments about how we view the merits here. And I'm doing that on the assumption that we'll make for purposes of this hearing at least, that our serious arguments will have serious listeners. And I want to just walk you through uh, here in my opening, our view of the report and the legal standards and the facts. First though, I'd like to make a systemic point about what we're undertaking here today. Because this is so unprecedented, I think we need a little bit of context for how to think about this. We have a process in the state for how to handle criminal allegations. We have a different process in the state for how to remove someone from elected office. Those two processes are almost entirely separate with one exception that I'll get to in a moment. One of the ways you know they're separate is you can think back to the relatively recent experience of Governor Fife Symington. He was indicted and served in office until I think it was the evening that the jury convicted him. Then he went back to the office and resigned. A criminal indictment or an accusation is not sufficient on its own to remove someone from office. And one of the reasons that's true is that political prosecutions much more often than other prosecutions fail. Why don't we think back to the examples of United States Senator Ted Stevens or United States Senator uh, John Edwards or Bob Menendez or Virginia Governor Bob McDonnell or um, Utah Attorney General, I think it was John Swallows or uh, Governor Rick Perry after two years he was exonerated. The number of political prosecutions that fail is astronomically higher than the number of dirty color prosecutions that fail. That's one of the reasons why we don't take a criminal accusation and infer from that that person should be removed from office. You'd have a lot of innocent people being removed from offices based on accusations made by people who are partially motivated by political causes. We would not destabilize our system by accepting the principle that a criminal accusation gives rise to a political removal. These two processes though, the criminal allegation and the political removal do cross paths at some point. If Paul is convicted, if he's convicted of a felony, he very likely would vacate his office in those circumstances. Just as after Governor Fife Symington was convicted, he resigned, Paul would inevitably have to resign or be removed at some point. But in the meantime, if you, if you confuse the two, the political, um, the criminal accusation with the political removal process, you upset and you destabilize our system of government in a way that is very significant. And so I'm gonna say to you here at the outset, the, the truest thing that I can think to say about this case, and that is this. If you want to politically remove someone, and the real reason for that is a criminal accusation, you can't, you, you can't use that, it's not a legal basis in Arizona. And so you come up with a pretext. You, know, you try to make something fit with the political removal statute. That is doing a tremendous disservice 
to our system of government. That is not the way it's supposed to work. The proper response, if the only reason for removal, if the only reason is the criminal allegation, you wait. The proper response is patience. Let the trial process play out or let him resign on his own time. But to remove someone because they've been accused, that is not the way our system works. That is the truest thing I can say about this case. Now, I wanna shift my comments a bit and talk about when you can politically remove someone. What is the standard for that? Let's start with that. And on, on the issue of what the standard is, your lawyers and our law firm are largely in agreement. It's on page 41 of your report. This is from the Arizona Independent Redistricting case. What is neglect of duty? It's when you fail to perform a duty that you're legally required to perform, right? Statute tells you to do something, you don't do it. That's neglect of duty. It isn't uh, taking long weekends. It isn't having fewer office hours than, you, than someone else would like you to. It's you're not doing what you have to do, right? And um, again, I think there's no dispute between your counsel and us on that point. On page 54 of your report, there's the money quote. It is that Paul did not neglect his statutory duties. The statutory functions of that office were performed, and by all accounts, they were performed pretty well. The staff in the office said he showed up as much as other elected officials. When they needed to get a hold of him, they could get a hold of him. Um, the, the, the office functioned as it should. And I see no evidence so far that people who needed to get their properties assessed didn't. The people who had problems with the assessments didn't get the proper reassessments. What needed to be done in that office was done. And I think that is the end of the inquiry. Now, I think it's important though to flesh out the details of this. You said in your opening uh, comments, Chairman Gates, that there were two allegations in the statement of charges. So I'd like to just sort of walk you through our thinking on each of those. The first is that because he was absent from the office, particularly during his 20-day term of confinement, um, after his initial appearance and until his last arraignment, um, he was necessarily, necessarily neglecting his duty. Um, as I understand it, you're not talking about what there's been a lot of media coverage of, which is that he appeared, or at least the access records from the Maricopa County um, administrative offices showed that he accessed his office about 53 times, I believe that was the number, over the course of 2019. I'm gonna put that in a little bit of context, if not for you, then more for the media. Those records only include the number of times that he accessed his office here downtown. They don't include the number of times that he worked out of the Mesa Southeast Courthouse, which apparently is much closer to his home and much more convenient for him. So he did that on you know, quite a few occasions with some regularity. And there, there is no key card access. There's no record of him coming and going. And so the number understates the days that he worked. But that is somewhat acknowledged in the report, right? Your, your lawyer's report acknowledges that um, they don't know what he was doing outside the office or if he was at home, whether he was working on the phone or going to conferences and so on. Um, if the 53 working days was used as the barometer, if that was in fact something that you were thinking of as relevant to the question of neglect of duty, our response would be, well, he's in good company. The, I have no intention of accusing anyone on this board of misconduct. I wanna make that clear. Like I will probably refer to some records at some point. I don't intend to name anyone by names. Um, and I refer to some records to make a point about, well, how does, let me, let me go with me for two minutes on a question here. Mr. Chairman, may I intervene for just a moment? You may. Mr. Langhofer, to, to make this easier, I can guarantee you that the swipes were not considered, they're not material. Nobody's arguing that he didn't swipe in or out enough. Um, so making the point or not making the point with respect to what others may or may not have done is literally not germane to the proceeding. Okay, uh, in that case, we can move on from the swipes. They'll come up one more time, I'll, I'll warn you, I don't want you to think we're surprising you when we bring it up later, but we'll re revisit at that point. And I'll warn you that I'll revisit it as well. So the uh, question appears to be then, what of this 20 day absence from the time that he was arrested uh, and he was held in custody against his will, um, does that necessarily constitute neglect of duty? Let's return to the legal standard. 
you have to fail to do something that you are statutorily required to do. There is nothing in the report and nothing that we've learned outside of the report that says during those 20 days, he failed to do something he had to do. In fact, the staff said, uh, uh, yesterday we had an interview with one of them, we'll hear from her in a moment, it happened to be during sort of slow time for the assessor's office and they were able to keep moving with their uh, reports and their projects without him. Most of the important responsibilities had been delegated to his deputy and his chief assistant, and the office functioned as it needed to. Again, no complaints from the public that I know of. Which statutory duty was neglected during these 20 days? If absence for 20 days is enough to constitute neglect of duty, again, he would be in good company. There are other elected officials in this county who have been apparently voluntarily absent for up to 33 days and 34 days in one case, 19 days in another case, all apparently voluntary because I have you know, no reason to believe they were in custody and unable to come in. They were out of the office. I'm not saying that it's something wrong. I'm not saying they should be uh, removed or uh, statutorily penalized for neglect. The point is just that as long as you're discharging the statutory functions of your office, being physically absent doesn't matter. We could do all this remotely if we needed to. And in this case, he talked to his chief deputy uh, twice while he was in custody, and the chief deputy was able to carry out the functions of the office. That's enough. Being gone for 20 days, that, days then doesn't give rise to neglect of duty. Similarly, if someone was gone for maternity leave or sick leave or family leave, uh, or if they took an extraordinarily long vacation, would they manage to arrange their affairs in advance or pick them up afterwards so that statutory duties were not neglected, that would be permissible. It may not be a good idea politically. You may get voted out of office for that, right? Someone may campaign against you. Um, Lori Roberts may write mean things about you. But you wouldn't be removed from office for that because you know, you're doing your job poorly, but you're not neglecting your office. We don't remove people politically for that. I want to move on to the second big issue, and that's misuse of resources. Was it neglect of duty for him to use his county computer to, and his county phone apparently, to uh, conduct some non-county business? As a primary, uh, pre preliminary matter, let's acknowledge what your report says on page 17. There is no prohibition on outside employment for elected officials. Uh, in fact, a number of elected officials in this county uh, have outside employment, and that's perfectly permissible. As long as, according to the Holmes case, it doesn't interfere with your county work, right? You can, you can do it, just don't let it get in the way of performing your statutory functions. And in this case, again, on page 30 of your report, nobody in the assessor's office said that it distracted him from the assessor's work. Nobody saw him doing it. No one heard requests for them to work on his adoption business on county time. It's not interfering with him performing his statutory functions, and that's the standard under Holmes. Um, the report that came out last week concluded that about 1% of the records um, on his computer were for his adoption business. Let's note that's very different from the 95% that the initial report said. Apparently there was an error. I don't understand how that happened, but these things do happen. About 1% of records. Let's just put that in context. I think it would be very unusual if we took a serious look at the records of anyone who worked a significant amount of time in the county and they didn't have at least 1% of the records on their computer relating to something personal. Maybe it's their fantasy football league. Maybe it's emails to their wife. Maybe it's a personal business they run. I just can't imagine that more than 99% of most people's time or time on their computer is spent only on county materials. I know that may not be uh, the sort of platonic form that was imagined by whoever wrote the employee policy. But we also have to acknowledge that employee policy doesn't actually bind elected officials. It's an employee policy. And as long as what you're doing doesn't interfere with your county work, I just can't imagine seeing 1% of the records on your computer as anything other than a de minimis problem under the policy if it applied at all. We have, of course, requested copies of records on whether other county elected officials uh, engaged in 
outside employment on their county computers. We have not been given access to those records. I understand that if we had, we likely wouldn't be able to bring them up here. I think that's been made clear by Chairman Gates and Mr. Doran. And if we were to bring those up though, our point would not be that someone misconducted themselves by sending an outside employment related email from their county computer. That's, that's not what we think. We wouldn't say that. The point is that you cannot remove a man from his elected office, his constitutionally elected office, because he did something that is a common practice others do with impunity and you've never removed anyone else for. It's basically a rule made for one man at one time. That is not a rule at all. That is a pretext. And the reason we would, the reason we've asked for copies of other people's records is not to say, je te couse, like you've done it too, is to say, this is standard. It's not a basis for removing someone because it's expected. It would be weird, in fact, if it didn't happen. In your report, there are four other theories. I'm gonna spend less time talking about each of these. Uh, but I think it's important for them to be mentioned because we'll have probably no other opportunity to discuss them. These four other theories are not part of the statement of charges. Um, they're not the reason you suspended Paul. Um, and we don't believe they could become a reason for you suspending Paul because uh, you can't expand the scope of allegations after the proceedings have begun. But that said, let's talk about each of them. The first is that because Paul did not cooperate with the investigators, it may be said that he neglected his duties. As a preliminary matter, it is not true that he refused to cooperate with investigators. Uh, you can see in Exhibit 29 to the Mitchell Stein Carey report, Paul said he'd be happy to be interviewed as long as the witnesses that he wanted to be interviewed would be made available. Apparently that was not satisfactory. I can't say I'm shocked, but it's not fair to say that, well, you know, he must cooperate, but no one else must cooperate with him. I mean, that, that, there's no way it goes one way and not the other if we're gonna have a serious hearing and investigation here. What if he'd made a flat refusal? What if he just said, I refuse to cooperate? Not, not the sort of conditional acceptance that he did. What if he just said, no, uh, I reject it. I deny the uh, legitimacy of these proceedings. I will not be interviewed. Even so, which statutory obligation would he have been violating? It's sort of bad form, right? It might lead to his recall. Uh, it, you know, certainly would lead to his election if he were viable anyways, uh, and he's probably not. Um, but it's not a violation of a statutory duty, and if you're not violating a statutory duty, you've not neglected your duties. It's not a basis for suspending him. The second theory that's put forward in the report that's not part of the statement of charges is that he used his um, computer and phone for non-county work. I think the idea was, uh, the way they stated this at the end of the report was that it may be a criminal violation, maybe misappropriation of county resources. I think they only put one paragraph or so in the report because it's not a serious theory. I mean, if using your county laptop for something that's not county business is a crime, I suspect most county employees in here have been to ESPN.com, for example. Hard to say that's county business. There's no way that's a crime. There's some sort of normal play in the joints on these rules that's expected. That cannot be the basis for suspending a constitutionally elected officer. The third point, and Chairman Gates, you talked about this in your opening. This is the um, ARS 253. Um, ARS 11 253 says that the Board of Supervisors may require a county assessor to give a report on the functions of his office under oath within 10 days. And your report notes on, um, uh, in its latter pages, I wanna say it's in the late 40s, that uh, Paul never responded to your October 24th letter, Chairman Gates. And it says, this may be a violation of that statute, therefore may be neglect of duties. This is a clever argument, which I'll confess I didn't anticipate before reading the report. It does not, however, hold water when you just think about it. The letter from October 29th made no reference to 11.253. It didn't purport to be a requirement that he respond under that statute. It didn't request any response 
under oath, as 11.253 contemplates. It largely concerned matters that were outside the office, basically, why are you doing all this adoption stuff? It did not purport to mandate a response, but I think the wording was, it respectfully requests a response. He was never put on notice that he had to do this or there would be some penalty. It was a polite, you know, politely worded re request. It didn't even allow for the statutory 10 days to expire before he was removed. In fact, I think his removal was, uh, I don't know, four or five days, I think, after that letter was sent. The statute plainly contemplates response within 10 days. The board can't have it two ways, where they send him a letter, suspend him before the 10 days are up, and then say, ah, you didn't act within 10 days. He was suspended anyway. He couldn't after you suspended him. At least that's your theory of it. Um, and then remove him from office. That just can't possibly work. That's bootstrapping. And one of the premises in the letter two was wrong. It said there was more than 1,000 records that related to adoption. I think the final count ended up being 850 or so. I guess my problem with the letter at bottom is that it's far too informal a communication to justify removing a constitutionally elected officer. And if you're to send someone a letter with the idea that if they don't respond to this and tell me what's going on in their office, I'm going to have to suspend them. If you're going to do that, it needs to say that. We couldn't, for example, send someone a text message and say, hey, what's up in your office? no response in 10 days and suspend them, that would be outrageous. I mean, that's really not fair notice if you're gonna suspend someone. And while in hindsight, they've come up with the argument, Mitchell, Sine and Carey, for treating that letter as a neglect of duty, I think the formalities of the letter just don't meet the minimum requirements we would expect to justify such an extraordinary action like, like we we're seeing this hearing. This is unprecedented. We shouldn't be basing that on a sort of ex post argument about what, what a letter could have been under a statute that was never discussed. For what it's worth, I think our November 7th letter, which um, I think if you do the math, was, was sent within 10 business days, does constitute a response to the letter, to, to your October 24th letter. We have a few more thoughts. Um, I think I've gone on quite long enough for now. Uh, why don't we call a couple of witnesses and then um, uh, take questions, or if you prefer, I can answer questions now, but we may, may be easier if we take questions at the end after hearing from a few witnesses. Yeah, it, what I'd like to do, Mr. Langhofer, thank you for your opening statement. What I'd like to do is, uh, I think Mr. Dorn has some questions for you just to help uh, the board better understand. I think you've done a uh, an excellent job of explaining your client's legal theory, but I think that Mr. Dorn would like to probe just a little bit more so that we completely understand Certainly. the basis of it. Happy thank you. Up. Thank you very much. Mr. Dorn. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And, and thank you, Mr. Langhofer. I, I think my questions really orbit around your legal theories and how we can best understand them. But let me first understand your position with respect to removal. Um, the county assessor has not been removed from office, correct? He's been suspended. That's certainly our view. And the removal statute works differently from the suspension statute, correct? That's correct. I think I used the word removal a number of times uh, uh, casually. Um, and if that caused confusion, I think you can just sort of substitute in your mind suspension. We have obviously views about where this is headed. Um, and we think removal is the ultimate goal of the board. I'd be happy to be proven wrong on that, but if I cause confusion by saying removal instead of suspension, I apologize. That's fine. I just want to make sure you're not conflating the two statutes and that we all have an understanding that they are remarkably different. We are, we're on the uh, same page there. Um, with respect to your argument on what the standard of removal is versus the standard of suspension, let's focus on the standard of suspension for a moment. Um, you maintain as a legal argument that the standard should be a breach of a statutory duty, correct? That's correct. You understand that the board takes a different view of that. You understand that from my letter, correct? My letter to you. I think your letter to me predated the Mitchell Stein carry report. And I had assumed that um, uh, based on its thoroughness uh, and its citations to authority, which uh, you know, conveniently happened to match our citations to authority, uh, we could at least agree on that standard. 
Well, I, I can tell you that that's probably not correct. And again, you've repeatedly referred to the Mitchell Stein report as the board's attorneys. And in fact, the Mitchell Stein report is the product of an independent investigation under statute, right? You understand that? I, I, um, I understand it's the product of a statute. Um, I, I want to probe in greater detail in a few minutes the argument that it has to be a violation of a statutory duty. Um, but that is your absolute position, right? Unless a statute is violated by the county assessor, there's no basis for suspension, correct? The redistricting commission case says it has to be an obligation of law. I'm unaware of any laws that are not statutes that apply to Paul in this case. I appreciate that there are employee policies. If you look at the scope of those policies and the wording, they apply to employees and not elected officials. You can additionally look at the precedent from the Arizona Supreme Court. I think it's the Hounds case. Am I getting that right, Tom? Holmes case, thank you. Um, and it says you cannot penalize an elected official for violating an employee policy. He's therefore not bound by it. So I'm unaware of any regulations or employee policy or handbook matters that would constitute a law that matters here. So we think as a practical matter, it's limited to just statutes, yes. And the Constitution, of course, that seems to be not at issue. Your preliminary comments seem to suggest that as long as Mr. Peterson's personal pursuits don't interfere with his quote unquote work, there can be no neglect of duty, correct? Well, neglect of duty under that prong. There are two statements of charges, right? And that's the second one. Correct, and that's, that's what I'm pointing to. Correct. As long as Mr. Peterson conducts his private for-profit business out of the county office without missing a beat as the county assessor, he can't be suspended, is that correct? I, I don't know that I would make such a sweeping statement. The, the standard is um, you can conduct a private business in you know, secondary employment as long as it's not interfering with your county duties. And I mean, you might as well tell us now. Is Mr. Peterson going to testify today? Uh, no, he's not here. His criminal counsel has asked that he save his testimony for criminal proceedings. I think you all appreciate the reasons for that. And we can get in the facts that we need through your report and through other witnesses. There's no need for him to be here today. Well, I, I kind of see a need, and, and that need would be really at the end of the day, only Mr. Peterson knows what he could have or should have done in terms of his day-to-day -day routine as the county assessor that he didn't do because he was too busy preparing legal pleadings in bankruptcy matters or personal injury cases or facilitating an adoption. And he's not here to tell us what he did or didn't do. Is he? I completely reject the premise of this question. It assumes that it's up to him to prove his innocence. The fact of the matter is the man was elected pursuant to the Constitution of the state of Arizona, and he's entitled to hold that position until the, the charges justifying suspension or removal are proven. It, there is no evidence in your report, and I'm aware of no evidence outside of the report that shows the man failed to perform his duties. The idea